It's like backstage. <laughs> you let me know when to start. You know, I, the I 10 people know. signed up, you know. I, then, that, then that means four people. That's in Well, it's usually 50% like, is, exactly. uh, is my number usually. Wait a few minutes. Has anybody here been to Cuba? I have been yet. Got out of Cuba. Okay, okay. <laughs> Cash for payment, they get out, you know. All good. <laughs> All right. Um, has, how experienced are people with bike touring here? Uh, I've been on a couple of short ones. Mm -hmm. just, uh, two nights at most. Mm -hmm. okay. I've done a long one in quite a few years, but I'm flopping in this gate. <laughs> okay. Great. I did one, uh, which was about a month through the Balkans. Oh wow! So that's my that's my point of reference. Oh wow, that's really great. <coughs> and so this is actually the first. Are we on Facebook Live right now? Yeah, we are. Okay. Kinda. Um. Hello, <laughs> welcome. Uh, do I? I've never done a live. Is this good? It's, yeah, it's great. I, I mean, it's so is far so good. You know, this is all a test. This is all the first time oh, okay. for anything. <laughs> We'll and he sent goes. me a code to put on my website. I don't even know what to do with that, so it's sitting in my inbox. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, to introduce myself, my name is Cassandra, and I'm here to talk to you about my bike tour in Cuba. And I wrote a guidebook to Cuba that I have a stack of them sitting in the backpack at my house that I was going to bring left, right on the floor, so I don't have that with me. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about my experience, and this is the first time I'm doing a bike tour in Cuba talk. So I put a bunch of stuff in this PowerPoint presentation that I think people are interested in based on the most frequent questions that I get. But I really want to have a discussion afterwards to hear what you guys want to hear about it, okay? Uh, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about the pictures as I go through them. This picture was taken in Santiago, uh, excuse me, in Guantanamo, Cuba. Guantanamo is actually a province. Uh, my first trip to Cuba eight years ago, I did not realize that. I think most Americans think Guantanamo is a prison, Mil military base, which it is, but it gets that name because it's in the city um, state of Guantanamo, which is a beautiful, beautiful region. Uh, it gets some of the most rainfall in Cuba. It's a super lush province. So this picture was taken in the city of Baracoa in Guantanamo. So uh, again, I'm Cassandra, I live in Brooklyn. For some reason I put a picture of me in the Bronx just because I really like that picture and I like my bike there. And I travel to Cuba a lot. So that's me on the right with a jersey I bought in Havana, which is really, really special to me uh, because I bought it from somebody on the Cuban cycling team and they get two jerseys a year. And so what they do is they usually trade them with other professional cyclists uh, when they're competing or they sell them to tourists. I was in that category, so that's my really special jersey that I barely fit into, but I, I make it work when I can. So I have a tour company called Escaping New York, and that's how I started bike touring uh, in Cuba. I have been traveling to Cuba, Cuba for about eight years. I went there for the first time for two weeks, and then I went for a month, and then I went for three months, and I hitchhiked the whole island. I was camping in Guantanamo. I got locked in a dive shop bathroom overnight in Guadalavaca. I got eaten alive by mosquitoes camping in the Bay of Pigs. And I just had all these fantastic experiences meeting wonderful, wonderful people. And when I came back, people told me that they wanted to travel to Cuba with me. So I started a travel company on a whim and then formalized it. And now I have a real tour business. And uh, separate from that, I run a meetup group in hiking into my Cuba trips and a book publisher found me on Instagram about places like that actually happens. I don't have a huge following, but they contacted me about updating a, like an 18 year old uh, Cuba cycling book that they had. Uh, it was very outdated, it made no sense to update it, so I just wrote a new book. And so um, here's some pictures from a couple of my tours. And I also just wanted to say that I love 718. Can I just say that right now? Um, <laughs> I am not a super experienced bike tourist. Like until my Cuba bike tour, I hadn't done that many. On the left, that's a picture of me on one of the micro tours uh, with 718. I, I did um, a couple of those. I did like a week long bike tour in Cape Cod with a friend, like we're on single speed bikes with all our gear and backpacks going up hills. Like it was not well planned. 
Um, but I made it happen, and on the right, this is so funny, I was looking at the new location today, and I just typed 718 cycle re into Yelp, or into Google, and this picture on Yelp came up as the first hit, and it is a picture I uploaded to Yelp of me picking up my new Bike Friday bike at the old 718 location <laughs> to take to Cuba. So I thought that that was so appropriate that this came up today. So that's me and Joe. Uh, on the bottom is my new bike, and on the top are uh, the paneers that I use from Arkel, uh, which is a Canadian company, and they're really, really fantastic. And I got that suggestion uh, from Joe, who, who also uses them. So that's my guidebook. Um, and then that's me on the left. That's also in Guantanamo. I guess I really like Guantanamo <laughs> pictures. Um, and that behind me, that is not Fidel. That is uh, Camilo Cienfuegos, who doesn't get as much attention here, but he was just as important as Che and the other uh, revolutionaries. So he's all over the place. If you bike to Cuba, you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images of him. I'll say... I decided to bring a folding bike because I actually have a surly, a surly long haul trucker. Um, I decided to bring a folding bike to Cuba because I heard, I heard that Bike Friday made a really good touring bike that was a folding bike. Uh, but because I knew that there were going to be situations where I'd want to throw my bike in a bus on top of a car and I wanted it to be really easy. Uh, also, transporting a bike box would have been a real challenge, having to break down the whole thing. Bike boxes are not a thing. <coughs> at all in Cuba. It is one of the main challenges that a lot of cyclists face down there. Uh, you either have to start in one area and come all the way back for your bike box, or you have to trust to have it shipped, which is, there's not really a good infrastructure uh, for that. Fortunately, since I have a lot of connections, I did call uh, one of the drivers that I use on my group tours and had him send one of his driver friends to pick up my, my suitcase in one city and drive it to another so that I didn't have to bring that with me. Uh, but that's why I used uh, the Bike Friday bike. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the general legality of travel to Cuba, which is not bike specific, <coughs> but because there is so much misinformation and misunderstanding and lack of clarity, I thought it would be worth going over that right now. Uh, it is still legal to travel to Cuba. Uh, okay, so the New York Times travel show was this past weekend. Um, there was a whole Cuba panel about it. I was able to you know, throw in my two cents in at the end. It is still legal to travel to Cuba, okay? Trump has made a number of rollbacks. Uh, he's cut the cruise lines going to Cuba, which is bad for the Cubans, because that's how most Americans were getting there. But cruise ships are not the best way to see the island anyway. Um, Trump cut flights to cities other than Havana. The vast majority of tourists are going to Havana anyway, so that's not going to affect most travelers. It's going to affect the Cubans who are going to visit family in other parts of the island. Uh, individual airlines have cut flights. Uh, so unfortunately, JetBlue is cutting their daily flights. They're just going to fly on Saturdays um, instead of the daily flight that I've been relying on multiple times a year for the last few years. But there are still direct flights until April. Otherwise, after April, you can get a direct flight out of Newark. Uh, or you can just connect in Miami. There's still going to be options to get there every single day. You're just going to have to go through Miami or Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so it's still legal to go. Most people go under support for the Cuban people. There's 12 visa categories, and you need to fall into one of them. <coughs> most people don't. Uh, most categories don't apply to most people. Uh, traveling for religious reasons, visiting family, doing research, speaking at a conference that doesn't really qualify. So most people travel under support for the Cuban people. Uh, the terminology around that is super vague, perhaps intentionally so. You just have to have a full-time uh, itinerary of activities that support Cuban entrepreneurship or things like that. But typically, staying in privately run homes, eating in privately run businesses, uh, uh, spending your money with private tour guides um, is still okay. What's prohibited is doing business with or staying at any accommodations that are owned by the military branch of the government. Uh, so that cuts out most hotels. So that's why in my Cuba by Bike guidebook, you're not going to see a ton of hotels. You will see some because Canadians are buying this book, Europeans are buying this book, Australians are buying this book. Uh, but Americans, 99% um, of them are staying in what's called Casa Particulares, which are privately run homes. Cuba basically invented the idea of Airbnb um, before Airbnb came up. So they're still really nice accommodations. Okay, so. You have to have your full time of activities. You have to keep your itinerary and your records for up to five years. 
If you are going with a, a professional tour operator, if you're having a professional plan your itinerary, like myself, we keep that information so that in the unlikely event that you're called on in the future by the government to prove where you were and what you did, we have that uh, for you. If you're planning on your own, just keep all your information. Keep your receipts. Uh, you should keep a schedule, like every day you're down there, where did you go, what did you do, uh, what did you buy? So it's not as difficult as a lot of people think it is. Uh, and again, there's still many flights to Havana. That change from JetBlue just happened like three days ago, so my PowerPoint does not reflect that. So can I just go to the beach? No. That's not necessarily support for the Cuban people. Okay, laying on the beach drinking mojitos all day. I mean, technically, if you're buying the mojito from an individual vendor, and if you're paying $2 to an individual vendor to, to rent the beach chair, they pay, you have to pay for the beach chairs typically in Cuba. Yes, yeah, you kind of are, but really it has to be proportionate. And again, the, the wording and the terminology is really vague, so it doesn't specifically say you can go to the beach for three hours during a seven day trip. But in the unlikely event that you're gonna be questioned, if you're at the beach for one morning, it's not a big problem. I get half a dozen people writing me every week saying that they want to spend a, a, a week on a beach in Cuba and that's, that just doesn't cut it, okay? But this is me on the beach uh, during my bike tour, so I rode my bike to the beach. This is in Cienfuegos and um, I just met these three guys on the way. Uh, one of them is a Spanish guy who was there visiting his Cuban wife's family. And one of the guys is a, a a retired Iranian man who's married to a young uh, Cuban woman. And the other guy, I don't even remember, he was just kind of riding along and he decided to like join us um, to go to the beach. Uh, I'll tell you a really nice memory that I have uh, of this particular ride to the beach was um, going past a group of young uh, cyclists. They were probably in high school and there were half, uh, maybe a dozen of them or 15 of them riding towards me as I'm riding by myself before I met these guys. And all of them, are you okay? Are you good? You know, part of that might be that masculine, oh, this, this single female must need our help. But part of it is just like that real helpful kindness, that, 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 that nature of the Cuban people. They're always willing to help. They wanna say hi. They're extremely welcoming. So that was just, that was, that's a really fun memory that I have of this particular ride. And it happened across the country. Men, male cyclists are probably not gonna get as many, hello, how are you, as a solo female cyclist will. <laughs> but you absolutely will have people waving to you. I had so many groups of school children waving all over the place. Um, in Vinales, Cuba, Pinar del Rio, all the way on the west, which is tobacco country, I do remember um, a teacher letting, you know, a lot of the kids come outside of the schoolroom and wave to me, and they literally waited until I was like completely out of the distance. Uh, I had a couple of girls in Bayamo stop me. Uh, I was connecting to the Wi-Fi outside, and they're kind of over there pretending that they have business to do like right next to me for the whole time, just kind of looking down. And when I grab my bike and I start to go, then they come up to me and, and start asking questions like, oh, where are you from? And oh, well, what are you doing? I can't believe you're biking. And the two of them rode next to me you know, for the next 15 minutes as I was on my way to scout another ride. So it's really a, really a wonderful country. So Cuba's relationship with the United States. Uh, we have a very conflicted past. Um, the future is uncertain, but it's really important to note that the Cubans distinguish between American, the American government and policy and Americans themselves. It does not matter what the White House is doing with Cuba in terms of how you will be treated there. I have never, ever met a single American that had a negative experience in Cuba that, Cuba that they felt unwelcome because they were American. It just does not happen. Uh, before uh, the country opened up, <laughs> and people would go through Mexico and Canada and third countries um, in the airport. They knew not to stamp your passport. They didn't care. They wanted you there. They want your tour tourist dollars, and they're very curious about meeting people. Um, if you just go to Havana, loads of tourists go there. Unfortunately, there's a lot of tourists who only go to Havana and they don't leave it. If you're going to be bike touring outside of Havana, especially in smaller villages, I met so many people who never in their lives had met an American. I met people who had never met somebody from another country because they live in a village where most people have no reason to ever visit. Uh, so you really are there representing uh, your country and you will be very well received. 
So why should I cycle Cuba? I can't see my notes. Uh, it's a beautiful country. You have really, really friendly people. Uh, I will say there, there's a lot of respect for cyclists. <clears throat> when the Soviet Union collapsed and Cuba lost the support of the Soviet Union, which was basically funding them with everything and supporting them with everything, they didn't have uh, fuel for cars. And so people began relying on bikes. China sent something like something like two million bikes, something like that, to Cuba to help them get around because there wasn't uh, good transportation otherwise. And so the cycling culture developed in Cuba. That started to go away again when they started to get fuel from Venezuela with, uh, with Hugo Chavez. But there still is a lot of respect for bicycles. The right lane is always reserved <laughs> for bicycles uh, on the freeway um, and in the street. And the freeways are not, I use that term loosely, there's barely any traffic. There is, there's boatloads of room for bikes. Uh, and so the right lane, it's gonna be bicycles, it's gonna be push carts, it's gonna be horse carriages, it's gonna be um, uh, anything that you can imagine. I've seen all sorts of contraptions out there. But there is this culture of respecting uh, cyclists. I'll also say that there is a much higher general knowledge of bicycles and bicycle <coughs> maintenance. Like I said, when I did this tour, I was not a very experienced bike tourist, and everywhere I went, everybody knew how to fix a bicycle. Same thing with cars. Anyone who can drive a car knows how to fix a car, because when you're, when you're in a country where the cars break down constantly, you have to know how to fix it. Uh, so that's something that really benefited me uh, during my trip. I'll say it has good weather sometimes. Uh, there's no snow, it's a very hot country. <laughs> it's a really hot country, it's very humid. Uh, there's rainy season. Uh, May is very rainy in Cuba. Um, and so in my Cuba by Bike book, I do have it outlined by each month. Like what are the festivals that you might want to go visit, what the temperature is like. Um, and so May is extremely rainy. Uh, I was there in May and it rained every single day and it was unpleasant. Uh, and you want to avoid probably August, September are going to be the worst times for hurricane season. You definitely do not want to be bike touring that time. But aside from that, the weather's really nice. If you go in the winter time, like late November to March, that's my favorite time uh, to be in Cuba, and that'd be really good for biking. It's also a very safe country. They love to say, talk about the fact that they don't have guns. They don't have a violence problem. Every single time I go to Cuba, People are constantly asking me about the violence in the United States. They are baffled, more so than us, about like these these shootings and, and you know every day, especially you know with with the kids. Like that doesn't happen down there. Of course, there is, there's some robberies. Of course, there is some crime, but it is very minimal. Um, Cuba realizes that they are heavily reliant on Americans and on tourism uh, for their economy, so they go out of their way to care for tourists. Anytime I had my bike with me, somebody would look at your, you know, watch your bike, you know, they'll care for it. And there were many times that I asked somebody to watch a bike for me because I had to run in and use the bathroom somewhere or I had to buy a ticket or something. I usually would ask an old lady. I heard <coughs> old ladies are respected and they are the ones least likely to steal your bike. So <laughs> I felt safe doing that. I would not do that in New York City. Uh, so it's a really, really safe country, uh, also for women, for solo female cyclists. I did have a couple of uncomfortable experiences with men just as a solo female um, cyclist, but also in my many trips there as a pedestrian. Um, not unlike any other country. I definitely felt safer there than I would bike touring here in my own country. So. Cuba loves bicycles. Like I said, they have this biking culture. They are so creative with it. I, I really enjoyed seeing the way people would outfit their bikes. So just about every bike has a little seat on the back for the kid. You see a lot of them with a seat on the back for the kid, and they have one on the front for the kid. This bike on the right here is from a scuba diving instructor that I met in Cayo Coco, um, on, in the northern central part of the country. And he showed me his bike with <coughs> Uh, a seat that he had built for his son, and his wife would sit on the back. So, where to ride in Cuba? You can ride anywhere you want. Most people go to Western Cuba because that's where Havana is. So, in Western Cuba, you have Vinales, which is tobacco country. You have Havana, which is Havana. You have to see that city. <laughs> uh, Varadero, which is the beach area. 
and then the Bay of Pigs. There are other places in there, but these are the main places that people are going to ride. Those are the main places that I have uh, outlined in the book, just because there's a lot to do. There's good roads, um, and it's laid out well. In central Cuba, I have Trinidad and San Fuegos. <coughs> Trinidad is an old colonial city. It's one of the best pr preserved colonial cities in um, in the Americas. And then you have San Fuegos, which is the only French colonized city in Cuba. <coughs> and then eastern Cuba, known as El Oriente, the eastern part, the Orient, um, it is only referred to as that by Cubans, not by anybody else. Uh, you have Santiago de Cuba, which is the second largest city, and they and Havana are kind of like East Coast, West Coast, LA <coughs> versus New York. And you have Guantanamo and Alguín. There's definitely parts of the country that I did not cover in this book because very, very, very few cyclists go there. Um, Americans in particular. Americans are not blessed with six weeks of vacation. So if they're going to go bike tour, they're going to go down for a week, week and a half. Yeah? How important is that language? Um knowledge of Spanish? Ah, uh, always helpful, not necessary. And I do, um, so in my book, I do have a section on how to get by if you don't speak Spanish. In any country, like gestures are very, you know, points and like, that's really helpful. Uh, there's also strategies. A lot of times people try to, you know, have some big complicated sentence, which is not necessary. <coughs> Por favor, si me pudieras decir, si yo voy a ir allá. No, all you have, just point. Baradero? And they'll, they'll say yes or no. So I do have some tips on how it would help. It's definitely not necessary, and I've known quite a few uh, bike tourists, Americans, Europeans, and others who don't speak Spanish that didn't encounter any problems. If you don't speak Spanish, you should definitely get my book, though. I really, I really recommend that. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I didn't include the middle of the country because very few people ride there. Also, a lot of it, you have a straight shoot across the highway, which is just not the most interesting to do, so it's not really a good use of time. <clears throat> and most uh, bike tourists that I talked to researching this book, but also who I had just met on my own in eight years of traveling Cuba, they're throwing their bikes on the bus anyways, which is what gave me the idea to put my bike on the bus. Everybody I met put their bike on the bus to go cross country, either because they knew they wanted to skip the middle, or because they had had so much fun somewhere, they wanted to spend more time here, they had to cut short part of it. So I have just some, some pictures for you here. Uh, so Vinales is, is tobacco country, it's really mountainous. Uh, if you want to go, if you only have like seven days, I recommend people go to Havana, and then you can go to Vinales for a couple days. I met a group of four Canadians who had four days in Cuba, and they were power cyclists. Like they rode like 140 miles um, for one day. And so they made like this two day stretch out there. And then when I was biking on the highway back to Havana, I saw them with all their bikes strapped to the top, top of a tiny taxi waving at me to get back to Havana. <laughs> uh, so if you don't have a lot of time, that would be my recommendation for uh, what to do. Havana, I would say two to four days, depending on how much time you have. You don't need to spend a week there. You could if you have a lot of time, but it's, it's not that necessary. You can see the main stuff in two to three days. Um, Varadero is known for its beaches. Again, you can't go for a beach vacation, but if you're doing this western corridor, it's on the way, you got to crash somewhere, right? And so you got to stay there and you can go to the beach while you're there. Uh, the Bay of Pigs is really nice. I, I have taken my groups there several times and I like the Bay of Pigs because to me it represents a real, a normal Cuban city. It's no, known for scuba diving and for snorkeling. So you do have tourists that are coming there specifically to dive and to snorkel, but it doesn't have this massive influx of tourists like a lot of the countries, or a lot of the cities. And so you, you have a better representation of what Cuba looks like in that city. Um, yeah, and from the Bay of Pigs, that's how you connect to central Cuba. So if you were going to go to Trinidad and San Fuegos by bike, you would go through the Bay of Pigs. All right, so these so are just... just call from outside. Oh, <laughs> come on in. Uh, so here's some pictures of, of Vinales. Um, so this, I think, is my favorite shot that I ever took of Vinales uh, during the tobacco harvest. Again, so the book outlines what to expect different months and different seasons. And for the tobacco harvest, that's going to be in the winter. You're looking at like January, February is a nice time to go. So I took this picture in February 
about three years ago, and I think it was, no, it wasn't with this group. This is one of the groups um, that went down there with me. Um, and you can do, you know, class, you learn how to roll a cigar, smoke a cigar, you can buy a cigar, and it is all legal. Uh, so this is uh, one of the groups with me riding in Vinales, and then this is me with my bike about to leave Vinales uh, to ride through the mountains, um, one of the most difficult rides um, of the entire trip. All the mountains came at the end. Uh, so Central Cuba, at the at the end of the ride, and, and you know where it's not like continuous that you can like build up that momentum. Like no, you go downhill and you go straight just so long enough that you lose that momentum and then it's time to climb. <laughs> so that's Western Cuba. If you're going to do Vinales, you should be a strong cyclist, be a really strong cyclist. Like I'm glad that came at the end when I had you know really worked up to it. <laughs> Uh, so Central Cuba, this picture is from Cienfuegos, the only French colonized city um, in the country. And so you have Cienfuegos and you have Trinidad. Trinidad is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Cuba, and justifiably so. Uh, it's beautiful. It's uh, old sugar plantations and refineries. It is uh, one of the oldest colonial towns and the best preserved colonial towns in the Americas. Uh, it has cobblestone streets, pastel homes. It's super Instagrammable if you're interested in that. Um, and there is a beach, which is nice. Uh, San Fuegos, like I said, it's French colonized. It has a flamingo reserve that you can go and you go in these little boats and then ride you out there to see, or um, paddle you out there to see the flamingos. They have a really nice national forest there that you can go hiking in. There's waterfalls. Uh, so there's a lot to do. And there's a, a tip that I have <coughs> that I stress probably too many times in the book is like you want to add in extra time for activities. I've met people who just like bike, 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 bike from city to city. Biking is great, but if you don't have a lot of time, and you don't schedule in time for the activities, you're really gonna miss out. Like if you just ride from Trinidad to San Fuegos, part of it is really beautiful. Part of it is like, oh, it's highway, or it's like, it's like riding through Iowa. It's like, oh, that's pretty, like, but I'm kind of sick of cornfield, you know? So that kind of happens. If you don't allow time to go hiking in the forest, to jump into the waterfall, uh, to do some of these activities, um, I feel like you're not really experiencing the country uh, the best way that you could be. Uh, so these are some typical pictures of of Trinidad, and that's me on the beach. I just, obviously I had to take a picture with those cars. Uh, right here, this is Manaka Isnaga Tower, and this is a, from an old sugar plantation, and you can climb to the top, and that's where uh, the slaveholders would like look over the fields and everything. And you can just go on your own and go shopping and walk up, um, or you can hire a guide. So like I bring my groups there to learn about the history and, and the culture, but you can walk up on your own. Um, you can also leave your bike. I, I try to avoid having my bike unattended with all of my stuff on it. <clears throat> Sometimes you can't help it. Again, you look for that old lady. Uh, this place didn't have a proper parking, but most places you go to, like for instance, I went to the cemetery uh, to see Fidel's tomb, which I have a picture of later. They have proper parking, um, and you would just pay the parking attendant, usually a dollar, to watch your bicycle just like they're watching the cars and it's totally safe. Well, my strategy was I would ride to a city and then I would stay for a couple of days so then I would just take my bike out without my luggage so it wasn't as big of a deal. Also, most cities you go to, they have um, the parqueros, the little parking lots, like all over town. The bigger the city, the more they have. They have them every few lots. Because there's so many bikes, they have little parking lots for bikes all over the city. So, Eastern Cuba, El Oriente. Uh, Olguin is known for beaches, there's old fishing villages, that is where I got stuck in the dive shop bathroom. Um, they remembered me the next time that I came and had a really nice laugh. Uh, Guantanamo, gorgeous, this picture is from Guantanamo. This picture is from April in Guantanamo two years ago when the flowers were blooming and it's just like a very different picture from what most people associate with that part of the world. Uh, <coughs> I love Guantanamo, it's my favorite part of Cuba. Um, La Farola, a massive, massive hills. Uh, this was definitely a big accomplishment of Fidel. Guantanamo, um, the eastern, eastern part of the province, Baracoa, is the most popular city. It's uh, becoming more of a tourist destination now. It was completely disconnected from the rest of Cuba um, until, oof, it's in my book, but I don't remember, the 1950s? No, 60s? Something, but so Fidel uh, built this road that connected it uh, to other cities in Cuba. So now you have more tourism there. And it went right through the mountains. So it's, it's very, very difficult. It's very narrow, but it is absolutely, absolutely beautiful. If you didn't want to ride it because you didn't have time or it's too difficult, again, you could throw your bike on a bus. You can do that 
anywhere in Cuba to save time or to save energy. Um, there's a lot less tourism there, which is really nice for tourists. Um, and also means that the, the people are more in need of your tourist dollars. Um, it also has, in my opinion, and in many people's opinion, it has the best food on the island. It is traditional Cuban food, but however, since because they were separated for so long, there's a much more Caribbean influence and it has a, a, a more broader Caribbean flavor, like more coconut milk in dishes that you don't see anywhere else in Cuba. So I love eating here. Uh, it's also where chocolate and coffee are produced. So this is the only place in Cuba that's producing good chocolate and their chocolate goes everywhere else. <clears throat> it's hard to find good chocolate in Cuba. The best is here. They have handmade chocolate with fresh cacao, and you can do these chocolate ceremonies. I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, I'll get to that picture. So this is Olguin. Um, that's Guadalajara Beach on the right. Uh, right here, we have a picture on the left of a gentleman uh, drying coffee beans just on the ground outside his home in Baracoa. And on the right is one of the, the chocolate houses. And so you have chocolate in different and cacao in different stages of fermentation. So you can go into these women's homes, and it's it, it's hard to find some of them because it's just a regular house and it might just say Zoila's house outside and you don't know that that's an actual chocolate house like this. So in the guidebook, it, does, it specifically says like what kilometer mark to go to. The book is written in kilometers. You got to get used to it. That's what they use down there. Um, there's some information in miles though. But you go into these homes and the women show you the whole coffee process. And so you get to try the raw cacao. You get to try it after it's been toasted, and then you get to try it when it's made into um, these fresh bars using honey. Um, it's best to buy it early in the day because I run out, but then you, it, might, it might melt in your bag as you ride back. Fortunately, that didn't happen to me, and my chocolate lasted a few more weeks in my bag. Uh, so another picture from Guantanamo on the left of Aracoa is right on the water, so you have these nice views. And here's a picture of um, the food as I was talking about. So this is kind of like a vegetable curry, for lack of a better word, made with like a coconut milk sauce, which is not something that you're going to find anywhere else. So Eastern Cuba, El Oriente, continued. Santiago de Cuba, this is from Santiago. This is that second largest city that has that like East Coast, West Coast beef uh, with Havana. I really like this city. It's the second largest city. It has boatloads of festivals and carnivals. The biggest carnival in the Caribbean, they say, is in Santiago de Cuba in the summertime. So if you can stand the heat and <laughs> go in July and August, you're going to be treated to a lot of festivals there. They also have some of the most interesting uh, museums in the entire country. So every single province you go to in Cuba, there's going to be, you go to the main city, they're going to have the municipal museum. <coughs> and it's going to be information about the city, about the province, and the majority of that information is about the revolution. It's about Fidel, it's about whatever battle happened there or nearby there, and you're going to be looking at um, uh, clothing and, and um, weapons used. Santiago de Cuba has really interesting museums. They have a, like a counter-revolutionary museum that you can learn about plots against Fidel. You can go to this old picture museum that, that has classic cameras and video producing uh, materials, and it has pictures that of Fidel that I thought were interesting, like Fidel scuba diving, like that's not the image that we usually see. Um, they also have museums about uh, music. Uh, Bacardi rum is actually from Cuba, it's not from Puerto Rico. The family fled there, but you can go to the original you know, Bacardi uh, museum there as well. Bacardi was the first mayor of Santiago de Cuba, and so he has a nice museum there. So Bayamo is beautiful, but it's very, very rough coastline. So Fidel's mountainous command station was in there. And so if you allow other additional time, you can do a hike and you can go to see the command station and see where they had like the secret bedrooms and the radio station and everything like that. And if you have even more time, you can hike to Pico Turquino, which is the highest mountain uh, in Cuba. Definitely not a day trip to be riding the next day. Uh, Bayamo, the city itself, doesn't have a ton going on, but it had. Um, it is a connection point. It has really good food, but it's a connecting <coughs> point between Olguin and between Santiago de Cuba. The most beautiful coastline is the southeastern part of the island, and I don't recommend biking it because a lot of it looks like that. You'll have that for like five to ten miles. So in the book, I have a proposed route, like if you wanted to do it, I scouted this out on a motorcycle just to see if I wanted to ride it on a bike and I decided no. 
No, it doesn't make sense. Every cyclist that I met who went this way said it was gorgeous, but they got <coughs> flat after flat after flat after flat. And several told me that as beautiful as it was, it just wasn't worth it because of the amount of time they spent fixing flats and pushing their bike mile after mile um, because of this. Um, the country's been talking about fixing that for years. Maybe that will change. I hope that will change in some in the future. Um, but it, it really is beautiful. Unfortunately, that stretch, it, they don't have reliable transportation for you to even bring your bike along those portions. It's kind of like you'll hitchhike and wait for a truck to come, but there probably won't be any room anyways because there's only two trucks a week. So it's gonna be full of people and chickens and sacks of potatoes and everything that's being transported. Um, on the right here is Fidel's grave. I'm sure you guessed that. Um, in the back, that big mausoleum is to Jose Marti, who is the hero of Cuba. He was a poet, he was a thinker, and you will see pictures of him all over the place. And so uh, Fidel made himself a very modest grave very much in comparison to that. And if you go to the cemetery in Santiago de Cuba, you can watch the changing of the guard, which is every 30 minutes, which is interesting. So camping in Cuba. This is important for cyclists because a lot of cyclists camp on their bike tour. You can do it. Personally, I don't recommend it so much uh, just because it's hot, it's humid, there's lots of mosquitoes, there's lack of facilities and lack of food. So I have no, I didn't do any camping on my bike tour. I've camped quite a bit in Cuba all across the island and it was a challenge in every single situation. And so if you're gonna be biking 50 miles to get there and you gotta ride in the morning, that makes it even worse. Um, there's not campsites like you would think. They have what they call campismos, and campismo sounds like camping, but it's not. It's a set of uh, really simple bungalow apartments that usually have water. Sometimes the water's not working. Sometimes there's a shared shower outside. Uh, there's not gonna be restaurant facilities, or there might be restaurant facilities and they're sold out of food. Uh, I know I went to one in Guantanamo that we got there at the end of the day and they had hot dogs and like soy yogurt. That's all they had. And then the next day they had coffee and cheese sandwiches. Like you never know what you're gonna get. And when you're a bike tourist, you need fuel. So the food is not reliable uh, because most Cubans, when they go to these sites, they're going to vacation and party and they don't have the money to be buying all the food at the restaurant. So they bring all their food from home. As a result, the restaurants don't stock food. They're probably not gonna be selling bottled water because if tourists aren't coming there, they have no reason to stock this. So it's gonna be really hard to get these things. Um, it's gonna be, I mean, you could light a fire and cook your food. I, I remember spending an hour and a half trying to cook some chickpeas in the forest when we were camping once. So there's a lot of additional challenges. Um, even if your tent is 100% mosquito proof, like the odds of none getting in are, are unlikely. Um, people might be bothering you, questioning you. Very fun, friendly, nice and everything, but there's gonna be a lot of things keeping you up. And at these campsites, there's reggaeton playing all the time, which makes it really difficult to sleep. And when you're a cyclist, it's hard to ride if you can't find food, you can't find water, there's no facilities, you didn't get a good night's sleep. So most tourists, bike tourists that I met ended up, um, even if they brought a tent with them, they ended up renting a home most of the time. And I've met bike tours who have brought tents with them and didn't even use it once because they saw what a challenge it was. And a lot of these houses, you can rent a house for you know 30 bucks a night. So it's not even cheaper depending on where you are. Um, so unless you're super, super hardcore about the camping, I don't recommend it. It also is gonna add, a, it's gonna add weight to your bag carrying the, camp, the camping gear and it's gonna add weight um, to have to haul all of that food with you. Have you done any like wild camping there, like outside of the campismos? Um, on the beach in the Bay of Pigs and yeah. in the forest in Guantanamo, yes. Okay. Yes. Is there, I've like read you have to like ask the vigilante. Like, There's no you, clear yeah. answer. Like yeah. depending on who you ask, you either need permission or you don't. And so I remember one instance in Bayamo <coughs> trying to set up my tent with a friend and we were told you're not allowed to camp here because this is an official campismo we're not allowed to have tents here but we don't have space for you so you have to rent from this home there's a big commission system in place in cuba so it's possible they only told us that because they were getting a commission from the room there were more bugs in that room than there were outside it was a complete waste of money <laughs> but 
Um, I've heard of people camping on the beach in Varadero. Like some people say you can't do that, but I've heard people have that story. So in Cuba, the rules are not as defined. It depends like who's working that day. Right. You know, are you slipping them a tip? But you should be fine. In general, you should be fine because it's not like private beaches like it is here. That's all public land. Was that helpful at all? Yeah. Okay. You can do it if you know how to camp. And so like this picture of us, so we, we thought this was really wild camping. So we hiked here from Baracoa for like an hour and a half with our backpacks. And we got here and it was getting dark out. We didn't see anybody there. We set up our camp. And in the morning we wake up and there's a bunch of people walking, washing clothes, clothes in the water here. Apparently there was a village like, you know, a quarter mile away. Uh, and the next day a group of tourists showed up because <laughs> there was a bus that, you know, dropped them off a mile away and they walked to see this village where nobody goes. Um, it was kind of wild camping. And then we had to, we tried to leave. This is an interesting story. We tried to leave the next day to go to another campsite, but the, it had rained and the water had risen so far. We had to cross the river with our bags on top of our heads. We get there and we were camp, we're, we're walking and we're hiking through the water is like up to our knees, which is a challenge because all these broken coconut shells are really painful to walk on over mangroves and you cannot see them because of how deep the water is. We ended up having to hike right back through that, cross the same river with the, with the water even higher with the current to set up at the same campsite. So there are, you're gonna have to allow some more time if you're gonna be camping, but it's totally possible. Um, what I would advise, the easiest thing is if you're camping relatively near somebody's home, even if they're not an official casa that rents to tourists, you can pay them for food. Right. You can absolutely pay them for food. And so we ended up eating breakfast with them a couple of days just because we went to the nearest shop, which was a mile away, and they didn't really have any food. I'm vegan and they brought me back two cucumbers and a bottle of condensed milk because that's <laughs> all they could find. And they all had hot dogs for dinner because that's all that they had at the I store. I was going to ask you how manageable it is if you, you know, are vegetarian. If you're vegetarian, you're fine because there's cheese and eggs everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, cheese, pizza, and spaghetti are actually the most common foods you're going to find on the street, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is very surprising. Um, rice? Very cheap. You said yeah. rice? Rice. Rice? Yeah. Not on the street. That's in a restaurant. Uh, in the restaurant. So the street food is super common. It's pizza and it's spaghetti. They're both bland. Cuba was the first place I broke vegan because I, I could not find food. I just could not find food because I was in the forest and I was in these tiny villages where they don't, they don't have whole foods, you know? Um, vegetarian, you're, you'll be totally fine. If you have an allergy, <laughs> you should bring some food with you. I brought loads of energy bars. Like the things that you will not find in Cuba are energy bars. Um, lightweight, dense nutrition, uh, mixed nuts. So I brought a few bags of mixed nuts and a couple jars of peanut butter and half of my bag was food, like just to have something to eat. So that's something to definitely keep in mind, um, and especially if you're camping. But if you like eggs, there's, there's usually eggs. The smaller the city you get to, you do run more of a risk of them running out of food. There's many restaurants I go to, they give you the menu. Oh, we don't have that, we don't have that, we don't have that, we don't have that. Or sometimes they wouldn't even give you the menu. They say, well, we, we, have, we have rice and pork. Well, do you have salad? No, we're out of salad. Or we ran out of rice. Like they cook what they cook for the day. You'll always find something to eat. Um, you're gonna eat a lot of pork and a lot of rice, especially if you're in smaller villages. Uh, so what about the weather? Like I said, the weather's pretty good, but there's a lot of rain. Um, it's very rainy in May. This is a picture that I took in February. I had a group down there and I'm not leading proper bike tours in Cuba yet. I've had a lot of people, especially since my book came out, I've had a lot of people approach me about organizing a, a proper bike tour down there, uh, which I'm looking into. But my tours, I include a couple days um, of cycling. So we'll do a bike tour around Havana, we'll do a bike tour through the countryside, and then we'll take cars in between other cities so we have time to do walking tours and, and cooking classes, things like that. So this was a bike tour we did in the countryside and it had rained and it completely rained out the path we were gonna use. So I had to hire this guy with an ox to take us across to the other side uh, with the bikes. Uh, so if you're gonna be like doing off-roading at all, if you're gonna stray from the route at all, this is a possibility and you might find yourself having to backtrack multiple miles in a place where there is not, um, 
Wi-Fi at all. If you're going, you should definitely download Maps.me or some other offline map to use to help you get around. It's not as accurate there, like Google Maps and things, like it's not as accurate there as it is elsewhere, but it absolutely is a start. But no, this is a possibility, especially if you're there in May or in the hurricane months. It was an experience though. I gotta say, one of the guys on the trip told me he joined my tour because he wanted an off the beaten path tour. <laughs> so at the end, they were so tired. Um, I asked a truck, I, I've hitchhiked all across Cuba, and I saw the sort of truck that I used to hitchhike on. I was like, wait here, guys. And I rode to the top of the hill and I said, hey, can my group get on this with you back to town? I'll pay you. And he's like, okay. So we have our, our bikes, we throw them on the back of the truck and there's a bunch of regular Cubans with like big old stacks of stuff. And I asked him, I was like, how is this for off the beaten path? And he was like, oh my God, this is perfect. But this is not always a situation that people want to encounter when they're riding. Cuba requires a lot of flexibility. Bike touring requires flexibility. Cuba requires flexibility. Bike touring in Cuba requires a lot of flexibility. Um, cars break down, uh, schedules are not adhered to, they run out of food, the lights could go out. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. It's a wonderful place. You'll have a wonderful time. Just going into it, just know it's a more relaxed environment. There, and I mean, that's something that I have to get used to every time I go that I'm a New Yorker. So I get there and it's just like, why isn't this starting on time? Why isn't this person here? And they're, relax. Like, they're not in a rush, and they're not there to help you be in a rush. So just expect that going into it. Uh, so the food, I'm going to say it's bland and it's repetitive. And no, I'm not saying that because I'm vegan. That's what everybody says. If you come, if you, if you tend to have a, a, a finer diet, you know, the guys I've met from Argentina are particularly outraged with the quality of the meat. <coughs> uh, the Italians as well. Uh, a lot of the people who go down there on my tours are like, oh yeah, you know, the food is really good. But the people coming from New York and San Francisco, they tend to not be as impressed with the food. I was talking about the spaghetti. That's Cuban spaghetti right there. There's usually some type of cheese on top. It is not delicious. <laughs> it is not delicious. I've eaten so much of it, it costs 50 cents. Sometimes that's what you gotta do. Um, on the right, this was when I went to my favorite restaurant in, in bar called Guantanamo, and that's my little metal tiffin. You absolutely have to have one of these to transport food, especially if you're camping, because you're not gonna find good food, or you might not find good food along the way. Um, a lot of the stalls, and so in my book, I mentioned where there's the fruit market, where there's a stall, if it's open, right? It's usually one person running it. If they're sick, if the product didn't come in for them, they have no reason to open. If their kid has a doctor's appointment, they might not be open. So you cannot always rely on um, finding food en route. So what I suggest is that just about every house is gonna prepare breakfast for you. You pay extra for it, it's like five bucks, and they will make breakfast for you. I would usually ask them to make extra food that I could put in my little container. Um, the di I usually ate dinners at the home half the time, and I would just ask for extra, and I would put it in my little container so I knew that I would absolutely have something to eat the following day, even if I didn't find a restaurant. Make sure it's a leak-proof container like this one. <laughs> uh, so, transportation. Fairly reliable bus transportation. That's my bike going on the, I'm not sure why he's loading it like that, but that's my bike going onto a bus. Uh, they're very accustomed to it. They take good care of your bike. Of course, it could get banged up a little bit, uh, but it's absolutely something that they do and you shouldn't worry about it. Uh, you can also put it on top of a taxi. They're very accustomed to strapping everything in the world on the top of a taxi. Uh, you can, I've also put my bike in the back of a taxi, which I don't recommend, but I was in a city where there was no other transportation and it was like four in the afternoon and I knew if I didn't take that car that I would not get to where I was going. Uh, for at least a day. Um, that's a little bit more risky because it's, you, if your bike is in the car and it's going over bumps, there's more opportunities for it to get smashed. But I usually like to touch my bike, make sure if it's on the top, but they're very accustomed to it and you shouldn't really be worried about it. So nothing goes to waste in Cuba. And this is one of my favorite things, whether you're bike touring, walking around, just like seeing how creative Cuba is with what they have. and. I consider myself a pretty staunch environmentalist. I used to bike my compost to Union Square, you know, from Bushwick, just because they didn't have compost everywhere 15 years ago. Uh, but right here, this is in Guantanamo. These are almonds that are 
being sold inside of an old coffee bag that has literally been stitched shut that they sold on the side of the street. On the right here, this guy is refilling a mattress. If you ever lay down on a mattress in Cuba and you wonder why it's not that, that comfortable, why is this pillow so lumpy? It's because they restuff it. There's nowhere to go buy another mattress, or there is, and they sold out, or they didn't sell out, but it's like 50 times your annual salary. You can't afford a mattress, so they stuff it. So he's on the street, he pulled all the stuffing out, he restuffed it, and then he has a mach machine and he's sewing it shut. Things like this, you can see walking around, but you're gonna see more of it when you're bike touring Cuba because you're going through these little villages. So again, with the nothing goes to waste, disposable diapers being washed and hung to dry to reuse. The upper right corner, these are beer bottles that are sawed off and filed down to be sold, uh, to be used as sugarcane uh, juice cups. There is sugarcane all over the place and they, you can just, you buy it for a dollar or a penny, depending on if they want to charge you the tourist price or the Cuban price, and they serve it in these old glasses. On the left side here, this is one of my favorite pictures in all of Cuba. This is from Santi Espiritu and all of these bottles are recycled bottles. So they take old water bottles, soda bottles. First of all, most of the soda you buy is homemade soda in an original soda bottle. You Questionable water, you don't want to do that. Um, but all these water bottles and rum bottles are stuffed with homemade salsa, homemade tomato puree, home squeeze, lime juice, homemade pickles. Part of the reason I mention this, like this, it's, it's interesting to see it and it's inspiring, but also I strongly encourage people to bring donations to Cuba. So in my book, I have a section of it. On my website, I have at least a dozen articles about Cuba. One of them is what to pack for Cuba and I have hyperlinks to all my favorite stuff and I have a section on donations. <laughs> it's especially hard for bike tourists to bring donations because you don't want to, you can only carry so much on your bike, right? At the end of the trip, you know, I'll leave <coughs> behind jerseys, um, sun sleeves, hats, helmet, whatever. Um, but just keep that in, in mind, bring some donations with you, or if you could bring an extra bag to just give away at the beginning. Also, cyclists are in a unique position to give donations to people who do not receive them. A lot of tourists that go to Cuba, they really love their, the person that's running the house, right? That person might not be rich, but they are so much better off because they are working with tourists and they're hosting people in their home every day and they're selling them food and they're selling them water and there's a markup for that. Cyclists go through little rural villages where no <coughs> tourists pass. So they never see tourist dollars. If you, if you can drop off a bottle of aspirin, uh, a tube of toothpaste, a hat, a shirt, it will go so much further and be so much more appreciated. So I strongly recommend that. So what I did at the end of my tour, coming back from Vinales, is I, was, I would stop at small little places to give the things that I hopefully won't need like in the next two days. And so I strongly, strongly encourage cyclists to do that as well. So what's a pack for Cuba? Anything and everything you will need on your trip, but also pack light. Like that's difficult, <laughs> but just think about what will you need? If there's any specific medication, you have to bring that. Sunscreen. Oh my goodness, my first trip to Cuba, I did not bring sunscreen. And look at my skin. But because I thought, well, I'll just buy it at the airport. I'll just buy it when I get there because I don't want to pay to check a bag to bring a liquid. No, this was eight years ago. It's a bit better now. It is still not reliable. It might be 15 SPF. It might be really old and outdated. Bring sunscreen, bring medication, bring anything that you will need. Um, everyday items are hard to find. Uh, contact solution, for instance. I usually wear contacts. Contact solution is, is really hard to find. Parts for your bike. If, especially if you're coming down there with some span, fancy specialized bike that has some unique parts, you're gonna wanna bring spares to that. Again, I'm not a very experienced bike tourist, so when I went down there, I talked to Joe and I talked to other really experienced tourists to ask them what I should get, and they had me bring down additional spokes, which I never would have thought of. <laughs> I never would have thought of that. You know, little things like that that could go wrong. Um, since I had a folding bike with smaller wheels, I brought like six tubes because I was worried I wouldn't be able to find any. Somehow I didn't get any flats, and I've met several other bike tourists who didn't get any flats. Um, and there are other folding bikes there, and there are tubes, but it might take you several days in several cities to find a tube. Can you say something? I was going to ask you which tires did you put on your bike 
no, whatever came with it. I can I can find that information for you. I don't recall. Oh, so you didn't put on like uh, say uh, Bobby Marathon or oh. something heavier. You no, no, and I wouldn't I would wouldn't recommend that because I, I discourage people from going to anywhere where you would need a super heavy duty tie, tire. Mm -hmm. For the most part, the streets are pretty well paved. There's going to be places like where there's potholes and such, and you can swerve around them. So no, you don't need to have like super heavy duty, duty tires or mountain bike tires or anything like that. Uh, oh yeah, sunblock and sunglasses, a must. So this is my book, if anybody's interested, I forgot to bring copies because this is my first talk, like that's what happens. <laughs> uh, but if you're interested, it's on Amazon, it's on Target, it's on Barnes and Noble. It's actually in stock in Union Square, Barnes and Noble. I went there just to check and I was surprised it was there and I felt really good about myself. And so the manager had me sign a copy. I don't know if anybody bought it, but you can check there. Um, or you can order it. Several people have written me to say they ordered it from independent bookstores. I've actually had quite a few non-cyclists write me to tell me that they bought this because this just came out last month. This is the most updated comprehensive guidebook that there is to keep up. So a lot of non-cyclists have written me to tell me that they bought it. Um, another woman uh, just wrote me a few weeks ago. Uh, she bought this book to plan her own solo bike tour and then she hired me to help her uh, plan her trip a bit. But she bought four extra books to hand out to people uh, along the way. So she asked me who she should give them to and I asked her specifically to show people that they're in the book. So if any of you happen to buy this book and tour there, please, if you go anywhere that's in the book, please show it to them. They are going to just feel so special to know that they're in a book, especially with <coughs> pictures in there. Um, so if you want more, uh, you can give me your email. I can send you more information about Cuba and all things Cuba. And I'm going to be speaking at REI in late February at some point about Cuba. I don't, we haven't decided yet if it's specifically bike touring, if it's also biking, hiking, or general Cuba. Um, but you can let me know. And look at that, 7.58 p.m. We're right on time for this hour talk. Good job, Cass. Uh, that's my website right there if you want any information. Those are my social media handles. This picture's in Santiago de Cuba. This is like four years ago. I love this picture because I was hitchhiking uh, with a friend and this is from May Day, which is Workers' Day. <laughs> Everybody has off that day. And the government employees have off that day, but they also have to go to the parade. So like, they're off, but they have to go to the parade, uh, which is very, very political. Um, and so I picked up the sign off the street because I thought it would help me catch a ride. And it did. At least a lot of people were honking at me. I'm waving it out like, like, bayamo, 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 which is where I was trying to go to. And, and even if they didn't pick me up, they're like, yeah, yeah, viva Cuba. And so uh, I just love this picture. Uh, but yeah, so that's my final slide at 7.59. Uh, if you guys have any questions, um, I'd love to hear them. And like suggestions for information that you think I should incorporate into uh, future, future talks, since this is my first one. Do you think do you think it's necessary to bring like foreign like I've I've heard people like who uh, convert to no convert to like euros or whatever no. you should bring dollars. I know where you're going with that no yeah. no especially it's changing super quickly right now a lot of places I led a trip there in November for the 500th anniversary I was shocked by how many places <coughs> were accepting U S dollars so I led a trip last February and then by November. A lot of places have started accepting U.S. dollars, and now even more. I'm heading back down there in a few days. Um, I'm doing my official book launch in Havana, uh, and I'm leading another trip. I th that could change again, because you never know what's going on with the currency. It depends like what the rate people are getting for the U.S. dollars that they're using to buy goods. <coughs> but right now, it should be fine. Most people are exchanging on the black market anyways, which I can't officially recommend. Do not just go up to somebody on the street to exchange money for you. But most of the houses now are exchanging money, and so you can just use your U.S. dollars. If you already have euros or Canadian dollars, um, I've gone with Mexican pesos, then you can take that, but you should be fine with U.S. dollars. Bring big bills, big, clean bills, 50s and 100s, because it'll get you the best exchange rate. Joe? Got a question online here. Someone what? says, um, Sean so says, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Gosh. I'd like to know how easy or difficult it is to take public buses and to put a bike on the bus. All right, Sean. Um, public buses. I'm not sure if you saw the part when I was talking about taking your bike on the bus. It's totally safe. 
the thing is in Cuba, it's not like public versus private. The public, there's not really public, I guess it's public transportation, but what it is, they have these proper buses, like the bus that you saw that looked like a proper tour bus. There's two different com companies that are both owned by the state. One of them's for tour tourists and one of them's for Cubans. If you're a tourist, you're not allowed to go on the one for Cubans. I've been smuggled on those buses before. It's hard to get on because if they find you on there, then the driver gets fine. So you can go on those buses. Those are proper buses that go in between main cities. So Havana to Trinidad, Havana to San Fuegos, uh, Vinales to Havana, Havana to Guantanamo. You can do that. Um, I also have a section in the book that gives tips and strategies for catching a bus mid route. So for instance, if you're in Guantanamo province and you got exhausted on those hills and you can't bike all the way to Guantanamo City, but you wanna ride part of the way, I give suggestions on where to catch the bus along the route. Also no, these buses have the exact same schedule every day. And these state run buses that you're paying for uh, that do mostly cater to tourists, um, those have pretty reliable schedules. And so the people in these cities and the casas they will know when that bus is coming and they will know where the unofficial stops are so they can stop along the way. The other forms of tourism or of transportation that I don't recommend if you have a bike <laughs> because your bike won't fit is they have a lot of just like old trucks and old Russian vehicles and things that like resemble military tanks that are transporting people on just like uh, benches in the middle and you're crowded in there with, with sacks of potatoes and live animals and such and there's barely room for people and there's not room for a bike so it's completely unreliable which is why I caution people against doing the southeastern part of the country because they don't have the Via Sul, the tourist bus does not go that stretch so you you don't have anything reliable coming through there. Yes. Another question from Canada. Oh, wow. It's a kind of three-part question here. It says how is the Airbnb rental down there? Uh, so I guess that's is there an official Airbnb, I think that's what the question here and the follow on says, did you stay in houses with family some days, which I think you answered. Uh -huh. How was the experience of staying in houses? Sure. I would like to refer you to my website, escapingny.com, where I have a specific article, what to know before booking an Airbnb in Cuba. <laughs> that will have lots of information. Mm -hmm. Airbnb, is, it exists in Cuba. It's safe to use. It's been going on a few, for a few years. Uh, there's a lot of peculiar, uh, peculiar, peculiar, why can't I say that? Peculiar. I can't say it. <laughs> right? You can't say it. <laughs> There's a lot of things that could go wrong there that you don't have elsewhere. Like uh, sometimes the map often doesn't work. Like I went back and forth additional miles at the end of a long ride trying to find places because the map function didn't work properly. You also cannot book an Airbnb through the app from within Cuba. If you've made your reservation in advance, when you get there, you can still check it, the information, but you cannot make a new reservation from the app there. You can from the browser. It took me like two weeks to figure that out because <laughs> nobody else knew that. Um, a lot of the, um, the amenities don't tend to be as up to date. Uh, I, I stayed in a place that I booked because it said it had a hot tub and I could not believe there was a hot tub. There was no hot tub. Um, I met families who were traveling with kids and they said 75% of the places that they booked said they had a crib. They did not and they had a one-year-old. Cubans get by without cribs. This family was hoping to have it. So you want to read the review reviews. Make sure they're really recent. In that article uh, on my website, and I have it linked on my homepage, What to Know About Airbnb, at the bottom I do have a list of specific Airbnbs from around the country that I recommend. Um, many of them I've stayed in myself, um, or at least I've scouted them out when I'm down there researching for a tour. So you can do that. Pros and cons to Airbnb all over the world is gentrifying cities, it is fueling displacement, it has so many awful, awful things. Um, I have heard from friends in Havana that Airbnbs, uh, there are more and more people who are renting houses as Airbnbs and so local Cubans are having a harder time to find a place to stay. I would say it's not as big of a problem there. Um, <clears throat> however, a lot of these Airbnbs are run by people outside of the country. So that causes a couple of problems. They're Canadian, they're European, um, some of them are American, some of them have never even been to that house. And so when you're corresponding with them, they might tell you something they've ever, never actually been to that house. Uh, again, this might not pose any problems, but there might be a question you ask them and it really is important that you have an accurate answer and you might not get an accurate answer. Um, a lot of people are also confused because they might be writing with somebody in English and they don't realize whoever they're writing with is in another country and is not the person receiving them. So they arrive expecting someone to speak English. 
and they're a bit disappointed with that. Cubans have been receiving tourists for a really long time, and they're accustomed to working with people who do not speak Spanish, and they get by and it is okay, but just know that just because someone's writing in English doesn't mean that they speak English there. So there's a couple other peculiar peculiarities, <laughs> uh, so I advise you to read that. Um, I have stayed in Airbnbs. I partly stay in some of them just to stay knowledgeable and current on the situation. Um, I try to book directly with the CASA because I don't know how much of the money in Airbnb is actually going to that homeowner. Um, it could mostly be going to uh, the people running it. And I've had Cuban homeowners that I work with ask me to run an Airbnb page for them. And they tell me I can triple the price, quadruple the price, and I can keep all that money and just give them, you know, $20 a night just to be on Airbnb. So know that that money might not be making that their way. <coughs> So I do try to book directly with the CASA. And so my, my book includes specific CASAs, um, but you can also use Airbnb. This also reminds me of something else, something I recommend in the book. I advise not planning your whole trip. Don't book, go on Airbnb and book every single room. Don't email every single place because you may want to spend more time in the city or you might want to leave. And I've met during my bike tours there, I met a lot of people who had to skip a city entirely that they wanted to see just because they had previously made a reservation in another city and they didn't want to lose that $30. Book your first night or two, book your final night before your flight, and then leave it flexible in between. You will absolutely find a place to stay and every city you go to, you can, like, so if you have my book, you can just call, there's house phones in every home. You can just have that phone and call to make a reservation. Again, if you don't speak Spanish, you show it to the host, you point, they'll call, and they'll make the reservation for you. That is what I suggest. You can also just show up and look around. If you show up in a city, it is very obvious that you are not Cuban if you're showing up on a bike. And people will be running up to you trying to get you to come to the house that they're recommending because they're getting a commission off of it. Yes. Another online question says, thank you, Cassandra, what? and Sean, great online? event. Are there spots available for the November Cuba trip? Yes, there are, because I literally just announced it because my February one sold out. Um, yeah, yes, there are spots. Please email me. I'm, I'm putting them on the I'll go to the website. Okay, great. How many people are watching online? This Twelve. Is a real thing. Twelve. Twelve. I mean, that's, hey. That's great. You know? that's great. Hey. That's great. I really think so. I have a couple. Um, okay. Just a question. Is there any advantage to traveling with the EU passport rather than an American passport? No. And the, I mean, the U.S. knows you're going regardless. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you go through a third country, they know you're there. Like, mm -hmm. passports have chips in them. The man is tracking all of our activity. Uh, it's not going to affect how you're treated there mm -hmm. at all. So I don't see any benefit. Okay. It probably wouldn't hurt, anyways, but, but you know. yeah, it probably <laughs> wouldn't hurt. I mean, you could. You could if you want. The other thing is just, you know, in terms of logistics and having, having traveled um, overseas and uh, to Japan and uh, Hawaii and so forth with my bike party. It takes Woo! up most of the room. Yeah, Joe and his group uh, outfit of mine all, you know, put that nice. all together for me too. Um, but, um, you know, it takes up most of the room in the, that suitcase. There isn't a lot of, of spare. Oh yeah, I didn't pack anything in their butt. So, <laughs> so what, did you take like, just like say a soft duffel bag to throw all the, you know, your, your panniers and, whatever in or so I packed the most efficient way mm -hmm. it was not the most comfortable for transporting so I had my Samsonite suitcase with my bike Friday in it right and then I just had I had my three paneers so I had one backpack I really like the Arkel paneers one of them was the was the backpack one so I wore that mm -hmm. stuffed with my Lara bars <laughs> and um, oh electrolytes the noon tablets, I highly recommend bringing those. You're not going to find that there. Um, and then I had my big, what is the size? Joe, you recommended the Arkell to me, the really big one. The 42, the Dolphin? Uh, what's the yes, model? The yes. Dolphin 48. Yeah. That's, yeah it's, that's this one here, the red one. I mean, yeah, that's the let's same hold size. that up. That's the other one that I had. Um, uh, um, yeah. That's not meant to be carried through an airport, but that is what I did <laughs> because I was trying to minimize. I checked my bike, and then I had my backpack bag, and I had that. So I, it was very, very minimal. I'm a very minimalist traveler, and that trip taught me to be even more minimal because one, one bag is food. 
Um, but you're fine with like a couple of pairs of bike shorts. It's not like you need to bring, you know, wool sweaters or anything. And I took a cab to the airport so I didn't have to bring a jacket. So yeah, you'll be fine. And a lot of homes will do laundry for you. If you're only going for one night, if you wash your clothes at night, they may or may not be dry by the morning. What I suggest is if you get somewhere at one, two in the afternoon, wash your clothes, put them in the sun, they'll be dry by the evening for sure, because that sun is hot. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question, like, so we're, we're gonna be going like around the Western, the Western border or whatever to Vinales, like in between, like obviously Vinales, there's a lot of tourists, mm -hmm. right? Like, would you say like cycling in between, like going to Vinales or like, is, are there also a lot of tourists on the way there? Like, No, so you're, you're definitely going to get your tickets? Yeah, we're going like three weeks. Woo, did you email me? No, yeah, my friend bought oh. your book, so I was like, I, oh, really? I, I flipped through it a little bit. Yeah. Oh, they bought it online? Yeah, I yeah, saw so. Oh, that's exciting! Yeah. Tell them to leave a reference if they haven't already. I, I need those references. It just came out last you month, might be guys. Watching on that. Come on. <laughs> um, do the route that I suggest in the north. Most tourists, they take a car across the, the highway to Vinales because that's the fastest route. Yeah. If you go the northern circuit, like no tourists go that way because it takes a little bit longer, but it's like along the water for a lot of the points, so it's really pretty, and you're not going to run into as many tourists. Also, that way you're going to be entering Vinales from the east, from the northeast, which is a completely different angle from what most people enter. Okay. It's absolutely gorgeous, and then you can come out, um, the, the just continue along, so you'll have different scenery. Nice. That's what I recommend. Depending on how much time you have, um, I mean, you could just take a bus back to Havana, or they were going to cycle through the mountains, right? Good. That's where you need to be strong. It is gorgeous. But yeah, that's the one. I think that ride was... If you're watching the person with the book, type in there what it is. It's something like 68 miles, 3,000 feet of elevation or something that was just on an 85 degree day. Like, that's difficult. Yeah. That's difficult to do. Beautiful. I would allow some time, especially if you're going through the mountains, you're going to end up in, um, like, Soroa area. I would say... For a day there if you can it's really pretty it's a great place to rest it doesn't look like anywhere else in cuba yeah it's like a natural um like ecological e eco village okay. mm -hmm. nice. What's it called? uh so soroa has a waterfall um and there's a botanic garden there and there's something else and then you continue on <coughs> las terrazas las terrazas is the eco village and so those are like maybe 12 miles from each other <coughs> it's not that far, but it's at the tail end of a very difficult ride, and there's a lot of mountains in between, so that makes it difficult. If you're a strong cyclist, you could do the whole route. You yeah. can just stop in Soroa real quickly. If you're tired, Soroa is really pretty. There's lots of houses there, too. There's a lot more houses there than in Las Terrasas. So you could stay there for a night, and then the next morning, you can go. And then from Las Terrasas, there are buses that go back to Havana, because like when you leave Las Terrasas, within an like half an hour you're going to be back on the highway then it's like highway back to Havana it's not the most interesting oh, okay. that's cool. that's so nice you could do it it's not a very difficult ride yeah. back to Havana but if you're short on time that'll save you half a day question there's a question time? about uh, experiencing like really um, I guess deeply traditional Cuban customs and culture like is it easy for tourists to kind of you know slip into some of these um, you know more traditional kinds of non-tourist situations are they you know that's the question that someone just asked about more traditional, less touristy situations in yeah. general. Yeah, it's if you speak Spanish, it's going to be easier. <coughs> Not to plug my tours again, but honestly, it's going to be hard because they're like a lot of countries. There's such a commission structure in place, and any country where you have a lot of poverty, people are out there hustling. So you are going to meet so many people every single day that are going to take you to the best restaurant in town. They're going to take you to the best bar in town. I remember my first trip to Cuba, <coughs> like the second day, you know, I thought I was meeting all these friends. Everybody's very nice. But it's, it became pretty obvious. It's like, how does everybody just happen to be taking me to the most important bar where Fidel gave his final speech? And, oh, your sister's here and she needs money for milk or something? So it's, it's you're going to get approached a lot for a lot of that. So as a new visitor there, particularly if you don't speak Spanish, but even if you do. I went to bilingual elementary school. I speak Spanish fluently. Even on, you know, three months into a trip in Cuba, I was still finding myself, you know, 
getting tricked here and there, it's very difficult to tell um, what's true and authentic and what's a fraud. So I really advise, if you wanna have that authentic experience, I do travel planning. I have people hire me all the time just to do a simple consultation or just to do a consultation and an itinerary plan and I will set you up with guides in whatever city you're going to even if it's just one tour here you know one you know session you know boat ride with this guide a historian a documentary filmmaker a journalist so that way you're going to get that authentic culture here and there and then once you're there with them on the ground they can make more <coughs> recommendations to you if you just show up on your own you're probably going to be recommended the typical touristy places Anything else? I know you said you don't recommend uh, off-roading. Um, we're kind of doing that that kind of trip. We have like pretty like mountain bikes or, or pretty heavy duty stuff, and like more of a backpack like backing trip. Okay. Um, do you yeah? Do you have any? Do you, like cause I, I know the roads are super rough. I know there's mm -hmm. lots of thorns mm -hmm. and all that. Do you have any any tips or anything about that? Not really. I would love to talk to you when you get back. Yeah. You're going in a few weeks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're going from Feb 15th to 23rd. Okay, well, I get back on the 11th, so I want to check in with you. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so <coughs> it's not something that I've explored so much. It's like I might find myself and like, oh, shit, like this, I did not mean to go down this route. Right. Uh, you know, I wasn't, that's not my <laughs> style of biking. Yeah. I've broken a wrist and an ankle, so I'm probably more cautious than most people about going off-roading. Um, and it's not something I was researching for this book, so I'm not super familiar with that. I would say Vinales is going to be a good place for that. Like I specifically said in the book, you want to meet a local person to take you around because a lot of the trails, they are not marked. You will not find them on your own, and they might end up with that mud. But if you are going with that intention, Vinales is the place to be. You're going to find a bunch of like little back roads and trails that'll be fun to explore. Yeah, and you could also just like... I mean, I, I'm glad you have my book, that'll help. You can also just look at Maps Me, yeah. and, and which is not always accurate, but you can look for things that kind of look like trails and experiment on your own. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's like, like, uh, like there's like the local roads mm -hmm. that like, I hear are really bad, but like, yeah. <laughs> it looks like a lot of them run like redundancy or like paved routes. So we were thinking, if it's like really awful, we have Maps on Me and we'll, fail to like yeah. see your route. Yeah. Um if we can't handle it. But I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious what the wildlife situation is like if you were to go swimming or hiking in the woods. Mm -hmm. And uh two, is there is there a problem with stray dogs? Good question. I intended to talk about that with like why bike tour in Cuba. Like there's no big predators. Like there's no nasty snakes and bears and things that are going to attack you at night. So it's 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 pretty safe uh, in that respect. Stray dogs, there are they're all friendly. Yeah. They're all friendly and they're all over the place. I have never met a mean dog in Cuba and I'm not sure why. Um, yeah, so if that's if that's helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, bottled water. Mm -hmm. You ever try treating the water? Oh, I should have said that. Water? Thank you. Filter, water filter. So I have that in the, my book. If you go on my website, I link to the one that I use. Um, I brought a water filter with me. I bought water like once, twice, in when I was I was there for a few months. Because by the end of the tour, like my filter was. I had already had it for like two years and I was having to put in so much effort to push, like it was hurting my wrist. So I, I bought a five gallon for the last few days, but water filter for sure. And people will let you refill it. Like I, I stopped at restaurants, like, can I just fill this up? Like it's hot outside and they see you on a bike. They will let you fill your water bottle. No problem. I've had people let me use the bathroom in the restaurant too. I use the bathroom. This is in the book. I use the bathroom a lot in, in um, like funeral parlors. I found that those were nice places to <laughs> use a bathroom. Women, it's a it's a bit more of a challenge. <laughs> it's a bit more of a challenge, especially on that road back to Havana from Vinales. It is there is nowhere to hide. <laughs> There's guys with machetes chopping grass everywhere. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I know there's like the, the, I like, I can't really figure this out. There's like two the, currencies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you transfer, do you like also get the CUP or do you do it all? Like, I do because I know how to use it. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, for a bike tour, I would recommend getting some. I typically discourage people from getting the, the coupe. Okay, so read that section of the book. There's two currencies in, in Cuba, the CUC and the CUP. The CUC, which is also called uh, the, it's also called divisa, okay. and it's also called the Cuban peso. Okay. <laughs> the CUP is called moneda nacional, and sometimes it's also called peso. So a lot of tourists get very confused by it. They want to they wanna use the local currency because they're like, oh, I feel like a Cuban. Oh, it feels so cool to use this. Or they think they're going to get a better deal. You're not going to get a better deal. Cubans are, all Cubans are mathematicians. Every single one of them can divide any figure by 24 to tell you what the difference in price is. So you're not going to save any money. And they get really confused. I've seen so many tourists just be like, uh, here's my money. Just tell me what I should get back. And Cubans are pretty honest people, but you never want to just give money to someone. The reason why I recommend it if you're bike touring is because in smaller towns, um, there might be some places that only accept the CUP. Or if you have small denominations, you'll be okay. If you show up with like a 20 or even a 10, they might not have any change for you, particularly if they have the local currency. And you can just get like where would you where do you convert at the money you exchange? Can, okay, you get both there. Yeah, and a lot of times you'll give. You can even request it um, at a restaurant or at a casa. You could you can pay with the CUC and you can ask if they have any pesos, um, in in change, and they'll get that to you. But the regular money exchange won't be a problem at all. Mm -hmm. That it. I think so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I might have a card I can give you. Otherwise, you have my website. You can follow me on social media. You can give me your email if you want to get any additional information uh, about me, what I do, or upcoming talks. Thanks for coming out. Awesome.